It's May 26, and you're with theCUBE. My name is Peter Burris. I'm the Chief Research Officer uh, of Wikibon Research and SiliconANGLE Media, and I'm joined today with George Gilbert. Now, what we're going to do is, because what we are committed is to try to ensure that we are serving our communities with the absolute best signal we possibly can about the big happenings in Silicon Valley, that on a weekly basis, we intend to bring you a CUBE conversation around uh, significant Wikibon research findings, and we'll do that here in Silicon Valley uh, with um, so many of the uh, members of the community, some of the thought leaders that are so proximate to where George and I sit right now. So George, today we're going to talk about uh, big data, and recently we did a significant piece of research on what was going on in the big data marketplace, and uh, we've Wikibon's done this for four years now, uh, and the big change this year was that we expanded it out to look at new types of application patterns that are emerging uh, in the overall big data marketplace. Why don't you take us through some of those seminal changes and how we see those waves evolving over the course of the next 10 years? Okay, and let me put that also in the context of the forecast, which is we wanted to get away from uh, looking at the last couple of years as a fact base and then extrapolating sort of in a straight line because markets evolve more um, with inflection points as we hit, you know, major advances. And the the first inflection point was going... Patrick, why don't you give us slide one? Okay. First inflection point was going from data lakes, I'm sorry, data warehouses to data lakes. They were sort of the antithesis of the data warehouse where you collected all the data in all its messiness because you needed that data to create the models. Um, the second stage was applying those models to typically consumer-facing applications in real time so that you could anticipate and influence and personalize each interaction. That was a major advance. The, uh, canonical examples of that are um, managing a, uh, optimizing a customer's experience across digital channels. Um, the next level, and each of these, the, each of these is an S curve. But when you pile them on each other successively, they become one big S curve. And so the third one is what we call intelligent systems um, of intelligent systems uh, of um, intelligent um, systems of engagement. Uh, well, oh, it's the one after that. Self, I'm sorry, self-tuning systems um, where. The key is it's not necessarily an application interacting with a consumer. It could be two or more applications interacting with each other. Fraud is a great example where someone will request a, a credit authorization and a whole bunch of different applications essentially have to collaborate transactionally and say um, this is, you know, a good request or this is uh, something that, that uh, should be denied. Um, and that requires much deeper integration between the um, predictive analytics, the new type of technology. And so, so George, yeah. as we think about some of these different ways, what we're really talking about is that with each successive generation, of these technologies, we're taking on more complex applications or more complex business problems with a toolkit that is uh, ideally more coherent. And so yeah. as we look forward over the course of the next uh, 10 or years or so, we're those are, the, I think, the two trends that we're really focusing on, is that the problems become better understood and the tooling to provide solutions for those problems becomes more coherent. But that ultimately ha requires that we look at things from a framework perspective. Patrick, why don't we bring up the next slide? And this is a, this is a, uh, Brian Arthur is a Stanford professor. He's now down at uh, Santa Fe uh, Institute, the complexity uh, thing down there. And for those of you watching, uh, if you have not read any Brian Arthur, he talks about things like path dependencies in the economy. He was one of the original thinkers around the whole of notion of network effects within economy. Uh, one of the first gentlemen to actually co coherently describe how technologies evolve over time. He was the one who came up with uh, the whole notion of uh, one winner, or it all comes down to one winner. Winner take most. Winner take most. You know, and, and 
this book where he talks about um, adaptive, like going from simplicity to adaptive stretch when you try and take a technology almost beyond its original principles and it gets all gnarled into each other. The example we use, I think, in the slide is the, you know, taking a sapling into one of those gnarled old trees that's all bent in on itself. On itself. And, and in, fa in fact, he introduced this in a book called um, The Nature of Technology, which was very much like Darwin's evolution book, but applied to technology. And the key point is, at some, po at, at some points, these platforms that we stretch to take new use cases collapse on themselves out of complexity and we have to start new. So let's make sure we understand that, George. So we have a particular platform, a particular technology, yeah. and people to apply it in the problem. As we gain experience with the application of that to the problem, people uh, specialize, refine, and they stretch it into different shapes yes. until it becomes obvious that it's no longer going to work and we have to start over. Let me give you an example. Um, well, we all know the story of um, Hadoop actually at Google, which what you know wasn't called Hadoop, um, but it was MapReduce and the and the big table file system. Um, but it was designed as a web crawl index. Then um, what happened was like Yahoo and Facebook and others said, "Hey, this is really good for huge scale data warehousing," and they added a whole slew of engines and utilities to make it you know. Uh, usable in that in that scenario, but that's when it got incredibly complicated and it really couldn't be maintained by companies other than you know those of that size. And so we're now back to rethinking the platform in simplicity terms. So the collapse has taken place yes. and now we're on a new platform. It hasn't collapsed, but as we'll it's see taking place. It hasn't completed, but yes. it's taking, it's starting to collapse. we'll see we'll see evidence of that. Okay, that, great. So that leads ultimately, why don't we go to the next slide, Patrick? Our producer, Patrick, is here in our Silicon Valley uh, studio. And uh, thank you very much for helping, Patrick. So if you take a look at this next slide, George, this is really how this plays out from a revenue standpoint. And what we're looking at here is we're looking at how the successive generations of technology that you discussed are going to be manifest as revenue. So we've gone through, the we're, we're in the midst of the data lake orientation, which is about, as you said earlier, Moving to moving our analytics thought processes or, or, or approaches to doing things to a uh, not an extract transform load but extract load and transform getting it in one place in the data lake so we can run a lot of tools against it typically in batch mode and the, the critical point is and sometimes we overlook it because we talk about the, the volumes and the variety but the key point and this is where Yahoo hit the wall was hey you know if we're trying to build a model of what's likely to happen, we want all the data, not the summarized or refined data, because it's the outliers that make the models work really well. And then the second class of applications, these intelligent systems of engagement, they need the models from these data lakes. And um, so, you know, the difference there is we have to take those models in some sort of production pipeline and connect the consumer-facing applications with the systems of record. Um, and then ultimately, we're going to get to, as you said earlier, this notion of uh, these self-tuning systems of engagement where we're not only refining against a model, but the models themselves are being refined by the system through yes. machine learning, et cetera. And, and a great example of this is like GE's um, predicts um, industrial IoT platform where they've got models in the cloud where they're collecting all the data from an ecosystem of devices and gateways and sites. And that gives you the big picture. And then they take those models and they push them down to the um, site level or the gateway level or even the, the device level. And those models then collaborate rather than you wouldn't have time to get the data all the way up into the cloud and all the way back to, to fine tune the operation. So here's a big challenge, George. We have a forecast that shows enormous problems within the overall big data marketplace. And we have a lot of examples of companies starting to generate some real returns out of this. But we are still early on in the adoption of a lot of these methods and approaches and tools and, uh, and new forms of business and business models. So Patrick, why don't we go to the next slide? George, I, 
you you found some interesting data from uh, one of the members of the Wikibon community that shows where we are for real in the adoption of some of these technologies. Why don't you take us through it really quick? Okay, this was actually the most astonishing market research data I've come across in a long time. And it's fact-based. It's not based on surveys. It's not based on, you know, survey monkey. Um, this is a company called Spiderbook that does, uh, in a way, social CRM where they um, can help companies target who their most likely prospects are down to the um, priority of what, of what uh, the product or service you're selling, the key people you want to call on. But it now that turned it onto the Hadoop market to find out you know, which companies are how deep in Hadoop to sum it you know, all up. And there are less than 500 companies in, in the United States who, are, who have either 100 terabytes or more or 100 nodes or more who have 12 Hadoop engineers on staff. You know, Hadoop is all we've been hearing for five plus years. And the reality is, even more astonishing, if you go back into the industry um, uh, cohorts where Hadoop has taken root, it's something like 85, oh, um, 486 of the top 713 companies are in tech. I mean, you break it out into software, into professional services, um, ad tech. But if you add all those up and then you look at the, you know, the few who are in like telco or uh, um, oil and gas or whatever, it's like a rounding error. The key point to take away from this is that um, tech companies have the technical wherewithal, the skills, the people to operate this stuff. Hadoop has a long way to go to simplify um, itself into a platform that mainstream customers can consume. Because if not, they'll choke on the complexity. Now this is, the, this is a statement about installations and companies with installations. It's not a statement about the, the uh, depth or the profundity of the way that these applications are being used. So oil and gas may be a limited slice, but there may be significant dollars there. And that oh, is reflected, me, oh, oh, go ahead. I, I do want to actually address that because it's not in the charts, but um, it turns out that most of the money, almost a third, appears to be in uh, fraud um, applications and almost a third in IoT. So great data. Now let's see if that's reflected also on the sell side. So we talk about a degree of immaturity or early adoption of Hadoop, even though this has been in place for quite some time, but the data on the sell side reflects the same thing. So Patrick, why don't we go to slide number uh, five. And if we look at this, we can see that the uh, marketplace today, uh, while being uh, well important, is about $22 billion. So it's sizable that we are not seeing a significant amount of uh, concentration. It's still a very, very diffuse marketplace across a large number of suppliers uh, in the software, hardware, and services arena. And that's indicative of a marketplace that requires some maturing, some, some uh, seasoning, if you will. But that's happening very quickly. Now, George, what I want to do is let's turn our attention to the reasons why we're still early on in the process. And we think our research shows that there's two reasons. Reason number one is we've got a long way to go on how we support administrators who are trying to set these jobs up and ensure that they uh, work predictably within a business, but also a long way to go on the developer side who still have not jumped into the Hadoop or the big data pool in a big way and started generating significant new types of value out of these big data, and out two, of this big data ecosystem. The two classes of administrators and two classes of developers. Developers are ISVs and then the corporate developers. Um, and the corporate developers need even more help on the simplification, unification side. And essentially the same with uh, administrators where, you know, you've got the on-site maybe moving to hybrid, but then there are those, you know, cloud-hosted uh, service providers where they've created some repetition around their deployments. But and they, just a quick, quick update. Uh, we're going to be releasing this month our big data in the public cloud yeah. research. That's not here now, but we will have that later on this month. So let's take a look at the challenges, the fundamental challenges. First, the, 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 uh, the administrator of big data 
uh, applications or platforms, and then looking at the, de uh, the developer side. So Patrick, why don't we go to the next slide, slide number uh, six. So George, what are we looking at here? Okay, so this one's really interesting. Um, it explains from an administrator's point of view on the y-axis, all the levels of the stack that need management, um, starting from uh, starting from you know the network, the data center, compute and storage, middleware, um, the applications, and and these are not accretive over time because the notion of compute and storage changes. You know when we have ephemeral, you know elastic uh, compute and and then storage associated with a node as opposed to the network or things like that. Um, so actually what, what, what the first, this first slide shows is if we really wanna simplify administration of this big data stack for an, for an admin, you want a single pane of glass. Now, um, Patrick, if you can flip us to the next slide, I wanna show you an example of adaptive stretch, which is where we take, I collected, before I ran out of batteries on a airplane flight, I just collected a bunch of consoles um, from you know half a dozen or a do dozen products before I got bored. And I stuck them into, a, into the box for performance management. These are performance management consoles. They don't address security, they don't address availability or change management. You're just looking at the Tower of Babel that exists in performance management. And I don't wanna, you know, I don't wanna cast aspersions too widely, but even Apache projects come with, you know, their own native consoles. I mean, we do have efforts to unify them. Um, but I might add that uh, I might add that um, one of the major Hadoop uh, uh, distributors. Uh, so, um, assigns 50% of the development headcount for each project that they add to the release to interoperability. And if that's not an inde in index that indicates these projects were not designed to work together out of the box, I don't know what other index you know we could provide. And that's just the administrator and, side. For, and that's just the performance for the application level administrators. Right. And I should add one more thing that also the fundamental business model of most open source companies is to make money helping their customers run the software because that's the hard part now. Software's, you know, infrastructure software has been commoditized for the most part. Um, but the problem is when you have boundaries between the components, that's where all the things go wrong. You have a different security model, you have a different way of handling faults, that sort of stuff. The consoles only help you within uh, a component. There are precious few that help you across component. Precious few, if any. So let me summarize very quickly, George, and then we gotta get on to the yeah. developer side, that very, you know, that today we have a very incoherent stack that is put forward by a very incoherent and diverse group of providers, each of which is making, or making most of their money by providing administrative tooling, and therefore they have an incentive for these tools to not work together because they want to keep everybody within their own stack. I, I would, yes, for the ones who are trying to make the whole, a, a deep stack. All right, so let, let's go to the developer okay. side. So yes. moving okay. on here, uh, on the developer side, uh, if we go to the next slide, Patrick, on the developer side, we're talking about really where the rubber is going to meet the road from liberating value out of these technologies. Right. Uh, it's nice to have the administrators have coherent tooling, but that's really a way of lowering the costs of administrative so that they could do more. Could. Here on the developer side, we're talking about how we're gonna generate the new levels of business value exactly. that are gonna solve these very complex problems that everybody's talking about big data solving. Right. solving. But the problem is, that's where things get really ugly. Yes, and really ugly would be a euphemism. <laughs> Um, the, the problem is right now that just the way these like open source projects come with their own sort of admin models, they also come with their own development models. And so 
um, what we started out with, what we thought was this great liberation, where you had in traditional analytic DBMSs, they had every type of sort of analysis that they thought they could fit in a single purpose engine. So it would be easy to administer and easy to develop for. Hadoop blew that wide open and said, you know, let a thousand analytic engine flowers bloom. And that sounded wonderful. And though when we got to the promised land, um, we realized, you know, we, we introduced a level of complexity that we never imagined. The mix and match had a cost, and that has to be rationalized. And so if we think about the implications of this, and, and I'm going to skip the next slide, and let's go straight to slide number 10, Patrick, and let's talk about ultimately where we see this playing out in the dynamics of the marketplace. And the thing to point out here is, first off, that the hardware market is not growing as fast as historical enterprise application uh, uh, businesses have grown, that it's staying a relatively flat. But we are seeing an explosion in the professional services opportunity here, precisely because of the need for really, really smart, really high quality labor to make this stuff work. But we do believe, George, that over the course of the next couple of years, we're going to start seeing vendors, suppliers, professional services people delivering software that will do a better job of bringing Co more coherence to the marketplace. Let me add two anecdotes to that. I spoke with Bob Picciano at IBM Insight. I think he runs their analytics business. And then I also spoke with um, uh, the guy at Accenture just yes yesterday, the day before, who runs their analytics business for EMEA. And um, both had the same comments about how to package these applications. They said it's very difficult. What we really do ultimately is a template and um, that requires that the customer have the customer has this at least a lowest common denominator of data to fulfill what they call an analytic record, um, which is analogous to the old data warehouse data models. And um, the point there is, I think, as you're going to touch upon later, you know, we can put the data some minimum amount of data together, but we don't really know the whole process for how it works. And, um, and so this is going to be a, when you look at the mix between professional services and, and software, or, or particularly at packaged applications, it's going to be much heavier on the professional services side because it's harder to replicate this and stamp it out like, you know, um, uh, R3 or Oracle apps. Right, but we still think it's going to happen in yes, some degree. It'll so it'll just take a while. And George, you've actually written some research. We've identified thus far three different, what we'll call archetypes. Uh, we're still studying whether or how the characteristics of different applications are going to come together. Right. Uh, but we have, uh, we've seen clients do what we call micro, big data micro apps where they're taking uh, like fraud detection and they're injecting it into existing operational apps. Another class is what we call big data departmental apps, which is effectively a shared service type of application yeah. that's being then exploited by a lot of different parts of the business. Cybersecurity being a great one of that. That is another pattern or template. And then the third template we're calling right now big data ecosystems apps. And these are the grand unified theory kinds of applications where we're doing dynamic pricing against e-commerce and demand management a lot early, early, early on stuff. Right. But it starts to point out how some of these applications are likely to come together. And what we're really looking for, and why don't we go to slide number 12, Patrick. What we're really looking for is over the course of, of the history of the computing industry, enterprise software has followed a repeatable process, a repeatable pattern right. of how it's matured. So if you go back many, many years, it started out in batch because the technology supported that. Punch by cards. That, punch cards would be an example. Yeah. That's where batch came from, right? We had batches of cards that we then you know, ran through the machines. And over time, as the networking and the hardware, but especially the system software, the reliability of the system software improved, then we were able to go to interactive and we were able to start tying systems together, and that was the basis for OLTP. And eventually we started doing things that looked like streaming applications, process control, uh, very, very complex uh, OLTP-like systems that 
ran with minimal human intervention and just kept going. We're going to see a similar type of dynamic play out in the big data marketplace as well. Why don't you take us through that just very quickly and we'll show where it's all going to end up. Okay, so the big lesson is that when you move from sort of one era in computing to another, whether it's the programming model, whether it's the uh, relative price performance of hardware components, it's not that any one goes away, it's the shift in the mix that changes how you do things. And this is the concept of adaptive stretch again. Yes, excellent point. So um, we took batch about as far as we could and you know, when we went to the first online applications where you wanted like a travel agent, you know, being able to buy an airline ticket rather than having to go to the airline's office, um, that was a, that was um, a, a, basically it was a stretch for batch and required a whole new, you know, infrastructure for interactive. Anyway, then we saw the whole ERP, CRM, supply chain era really, you know, took um, interactive off. Now, what we're seeing is what started, yes, in the process control area, but more fundamentally in, in managing software and hardware infrastructure with streaming the machine data. Now we're taking that and applying it very broadly to the Internet of Things, where it's continuous. And I should say, streaming is the real-time acquisition and processing of data. Continuous apps are ones that combine batch, interactive, and streaming. So about, you want it, Patrick, slide number 13. And so what you're basically saying, George, is that we're going to see the big data marketplace follow a similar type of a pattern where the technologies associated with batch and interactive and streaming start coming together and put and create a coherent stack that administrators have a straightforward way of, of administering. Developers will have a more coherent way of building applications on top of. It may never be as simple as it was in the uh, OLTP yeah. database arena because of the complexity of the problems that we're fundamentally trying to solve. But nonetheless, we'll see all those technologies come together over the course of the next 10 years and into what we're calling continuous big data processing. And, and I w if I would only add one thing, it's like we used to, if we used to deal with streaming over here and batch over here and interactive over here, and we're moving towards a layer that hides you from all those. Got it, so the next slide, quickly summarizes what we mean by this. If we take a look at the, how the marketplace is going to evolve over the course of the next 10 years, basically that yellow line with the red dots on it is how we anticipate seeing the workloads that are being invested in, in big data, moving towards this streaming, continuous, coherent platform that we think is going to start picking up speed from a developer, from a, from a, from a delivery and vendor standpoint, over the course of the next few years. And that it cuts across the different classes of apps that we talked about, such as data lakes, which can feature continuous processing, then intelligent systems of uh, engagement, and finally uh, self-tuning uh, systems of intelligence, that all those can see a shift. The application, um, the application designs can be the same, but underneath we're moving towards you know, continuous processing. So George, why don't you take 30 seconds, tell us what's on the horizon for your research. What are you looking at over the course of the next few months? Um, basically, the, what, what we haven't seen a lot of uh, is trying to create um, a, a framework for how uh, big data applications might emerge. I mean, that's, it just hasn't gotten a lot of attention. The, the, there's been an intense focus on um, machine learning and streaming and so the, the infrastructure technologies right. and what you're focusing your attention on increasingly is yes. that kind of the, that critical path for how we're going to move from problem to so, operating software but i would add that we want to come at it from two angles because like when we're getting you know a really good bidirectional information flow with databricks the spark guys and They've started to talk about like, so how would a fraud app change when you're using continuous processing? And then we can go to the fraud guys 
we can go to the, you know, some of the fraud application um, developers or vendors and say, well, what would you do differently with this capability? All right, that was my timer, George. We're done. And that's, that's your timer. So this has been a CUBE conversation with Wikibon. We want to do this on a weekly basis as SiliconANGLE evolves, as the application of the technology that SiliconANGLE delivers evolves, we will bring you the signal from the noise here in Silicon Valley in SiliconANGLE Media's uh, new studio on the corner of uh, San Antonio and Charleston uh, with the phenomenal crew uh, from the Cube. So thanks very much for watching the Cube and week, uh, Wikibon Weekly, and we'll talk to you again soon. Thank you very much. Bye.